presentation uh, will be by Professor Cheng Ki Li and his team from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Sorry? It is. It's close. While they're sorting out the uh, PowerPoint presentation, I'll just say that I have another uh, conference to go to, so I won't be able to stay to the end of this presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Anna will take over from here. Thank you all very much. Say. Say, unfortunately, is speaking at a panel in uh, about 10 minutes across campus. So. Thank you very much. I'm, here. I'm the, the project coordinator for this uh, transporting Hong Kong's Ocean Container Transport Logistics. And uh, this is a teamwork. We have four area. We have the tactical planning area at area one, strategic planning at area two, and also policy, you know, issue of area three, and also integrated decision support system in area four. Since this is a teamwork, so we decided to ask uh, each area coordinator to come here to make a presentation. I must say I will make a brief introduction in area one presentation to you, and thank you for coming. Okay, Hong Kong has been a leading regional logistics hub for many, many years, but recently in the last five or ten years, uh, facing a severe challenge from the nearby city. Okay, so this is a critical moment for Hong Kong to regain the leading position by imposing the advantage. What's the advantage we need to understand and also to fix in the future direction. So in this, in this aspect, people always try to think about London and you know, New York just friends. Okay, London and New York had been evolved from the post city to a modern financial information hub. Okay, another extreme case in Rotterdam in Netherlands still keep at the physical floor. So people were thinking about what's Hong Kong's future direction? What's the point of Hong Kong? We believe that it is important and Hong Kong should follow a mixed model. In the sense that Hong Kong should keep logistics foundation and then use this one to promote financial and service and other industry. Hong Kong is different from London. Hong Kong is different from New York. London and New York in a nearby city are one country, one system. I think the previous one also predicted. Hong Kong is one country, two system, and, and, and China. So you need to keep the boundary, and then Hong Kong need to keep the logistics foundation, keep the physical flow, keep going. I put, we put it, we our team also feel like, like Singapore. Singapore keep the physical flow, and then also the deliver financial flow, okay? And uh, Hong Kong is <coughs> is very, very important to keep this physical flow, otherwise we, we are not uh, uh, you know, optimistic about this one. We believe logistics. Hong Kong and Shenzhen together is the world's largest logistics zone. Okay, so we need to keep in this direction. So this is uh, <coughs> why we study this area, and why is the ocean container? Why is not air logistics? Air logistics is world study in the in the in the uh, academic field for air logistics, but ocean container logistics, especially from operation research management side point of view, still under study. Okay, so in this uh, aspect, volatile economic already studies for many many years, but usually they try to address strategic cons question conceptually. Okay, and uh, from the uh, perspective of port authority or container terminal, or ocean carrier point of view, or they use empirical study to kind of describe the future aggregate trend. Okay, all operating research actually already have many, many people studying this area, but mainly focus in terminal operation improvement. Uh, you know, container move and uh, this one is very, very local time. But from the whole supply chain point of view, from shipper, container, carrier, there is whole supply chain point is understudy. 
information sharing, contract theory, revenue manager, empty container reposition, these are all unnecessary. So this project purpose is to try to go this direction. So our goal is to, I usually go global externally. We want to establish Hong Kong as a global research hub for ocean container transport logistics. We also want to have make a global local impact because as I mentioned earlier, this is a very important area for Hong Kong Logistics and trade come out to get about 25% GDP of Hong Kong. And also, as I mentioned earlier, is a foundation for promoting other. You know. So we want to do this one. So we try to develop a uh, 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 stable research hub and also. So this is a teamwork. And I'm project coordinator. This involves uh, HKUSD, Hong Kong Institute, and we also have a collaborator. This uh, one is from Netherlands and also Korea. Korea Po is very, you know, and we, uh, based on the comment, we also invited some other universities, even after the founder, pro so they joined, and actually the team become bigger and bigger. We have collaborated from Singapore, we have collaborated from UK, so on and so on. So it's become bigger and bigger. We are quite happy about this one. So the project management, I also want to emphasize, basically the teamwork. We have the whole area, as I mentioned, technical planning, okay? Or container position, uh, terminal operation improvement, and uh, then uh, MD container position network, and uh, this strategic planning, Abraha, and uh, here it's Professor James, one of the third area, strategic government policy, and uh, integrating decision support system, Professor Homing, again, we make a presentation. And uh, I will add the end that we do an industry advisory board, include OOCL, HIT, Philips, and uh, Hong Kong Shipper Council. So we have the regular meeting with them, they are very, very supportive. We really appreciate, provide terminology, provide data for us. And we do work very serious. Every two months we have seminar, and we even have retreat, <laughs> and we have team management. So it's, we work very closely. So what's the progress? This is a very special area because of original, most of the team members are in operation research management science area, but we cross another discipline, marine time and uh, transportation area. So we take us quite a lot of time to acquire enough terminology for the member. We need to visit the company. We need to, I'm an uh, industry DA to, to help to transform this in terminology to all the people. And then I'm happy to, report that most of our team, we already acquired in our domain. And of course, this is a RGG project, so we need to publish paper. We need to make a presentation in conference. Actually, next month, we have a conference in Hong Kong, international you know, production operation management conference. We have three sections, you know, all same base, three sections. We, we will make a presentation here, and we also deliver about five keynote speech in the international conference. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important for young <laughs> junior researcher. They are the really one work very hard. So we are very happy about it to report actually we have a good accomplishment this one. For example, one of the student paper got a student paper award in Singapore International Marine Tide Conference. And also we have a young, uh, young uh, researcher, you know, she was fully trained and supported by this project. Just just joined the same thing, you know, very recently already got a National Science Foundation going and have another example I didn't this here also have another one also do the same. So it's quite happy. And we work very closely with industry. Especially all here HIT, they are very, very helpful, provide in our terminology, you know, provide data for us and they're very, very supportive. And even I met with them quite often, yeah. Include a very senior level CEO and so on and also the level. So it's very good. So that's probably the introduction. And I'm going to talk about the first area, technical planning. And this particular one, we have four areas. Container operation management improvement and the vessel speed optimization. That's a recent very hot topic of slow steaming. And then safety disruption also very interesting, very important. And of course, service network design. So the first one is the container operation. Why we need still need to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, this is traditional, a lot of operation research already talked about. But this is still very, very important area because according to a survey, the whole supply chain, the delay, and reliability is due to 65% is due to port congestion, okay? And this is especially because the ship become bigger and bigger. And they request a fast turnaround time. 
So it's become very, very challenging. Although this old study area, but because the new technology and because the environment, it changed a lot. So bigger and cheaper and then tight. Okay, and because the slow steaming means that the, the vessel's speed is slow. But so the, on, on the other area, they slow down, but they request the turnaround time fast. Because this one, they can squeeze the time, you know. So it become very important area. So, roughly speaking, if you are not in this area, this uh, vessel arrival, this key crane, load your unloaded uh, container, and, uh, and the vehicle take it to the uh, so-called staking area, temporary staking area, in the evening, they need to reach and then they get out to the outside. Okay, so obviously this is a very important area, both location and then also and so. So in this particular area we have done, we have two working table finished already. This is more in the yard area relocation because this is very important for the efficient, you know. Another one is paper, it's about when the vessel arrive, how do you load a load. This is the first paper able to find out Polynomial optimal solution. <laughs> Usually, traditional people use heuristic, you know, no, no, we were able to find uh, uh, first polynomial time and uh, optimal solution. Okay, the, the, uh, so this is another one because Hong Kong become more and more from the import export gate. I mean, to the Pearl River, the import export gate. From this kind of position, become a transhuman. Like Singapore. Singapore 90 percent is transhuman. Hong Kong now is 60 percent. From traditional very low transhuman now become more and more transhuman. So this is a very important container transhuman, you know, how to use your okay. container key crane scheduling is so and so are very, very important. So we, we are really quite exciting because the result is very, very exciting. The bounds of performance improvement compared to literature, compared to commercial package is very, very, very fast. So we are collecting the data on HIT now to, to test, you know, okay? So the next one is speed. <laughs> speed. Because in a 2009 of economic recession, so the vessel becomes slow and slow. Why slow and slow? Because uh, bank consumption is non-linear. Okay, if you reduce the speed a little bit, the saving is huge. So it's going to reduce it and so on and so on. But up to, up to recession, you know, in 2010, 2011, 2012, the speed still keeps slowing. <laughs> and people wonder why, you know, because the economy is going to pay. And eventually they found it because the bank consumption is so important. CO2. Oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, you know, also reduce. So it's become a very interesting issue, you know. And also, the, the shipping line, uh, usually, if you are not in this area, usually say, for example, six weeks, you need to go through the one cycle. Every week, they need to have one vessel leaving. Okay, every week. So how do you design the schedule? Because once you have congestion in some port, you need to speed up. Because you already promised, you know, somewhere, but speed of course a lot. So the question, how do you design? It's very, very important. So we have two paper in this area, uh, related to this area. We try to study from academic point, stochastic case point, be what impact and then reliability issue. And then here is probably yeah, more interesting is this one. We use all Seattle data last three years, and uh, then based on their old schedule, and uh, we develop a new schedule. We use the process as well as simulation to develop the new schedule for them, and uh, the saving of bank consumption, you know, is 11%. Of course, this idea case, you know, but according to industry told me, even just 1% is very, very significant already, because bank consumption costs about one third of the whole operating cost. It's very, very significant. So, even just 1% is very, so we we just continue testing, you know, this data. Okay, hope can implement. You know, okay, so this is about the third so, so one. Is, of course, safety. Safety is a very important disruption. So we we also working in this area. You know, support. This is the the motivation. I think you understand whether now even pilot very important. Somalia and so and so become very interesting, you know, okay? So we work on this area. We have one paper also already, you know, once you delay, should you skip or speed up or whatever? You can change it out, you can speed it pull and you are all kind of way, you know. Actually, we also, uh, uh, so also have another paper working about pilot. 
Because once you have pilot error, you need to speed up. They are chasing you, you know, they are chasing you. So you need to speed up or you need to skip an area. So you skip or chasing our so and so. Okay. Actually, I just saw a news, uh, newspaper last uh, two weeks, few weeks ago. You know, a, a singer called Britney Spear? Young, younger generation. No, I actually I think remember <laughs> they use the Britney Spears uh, song to scare the <laughs> pirate because they hate the her song. No, seriously, this is in the newspaper report, the Metro. Uh, you will understand. They use their <laughs> song to s s scare them. You know, <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. This is not in the report. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the last one is the technical network design. Okay, because this uh, empty container transshipment, you are letting container, and uh, you are also routing, and also important is the carrier alliance. You remember, I said every six weeks you need to run cycle. So every week you need to run this or leaving. The, if you are a company like OOC, they are number 11 in the world, you cannot afford to every week a big ship. So they use so called alliance. Alliance means this week my ship out, next week your ship, and one week later your ship. So this alliance. But this makes the whole neighborhood that even more interesting, more challenge. Okay, so we are working in this area, and here is some report to you. Due to time constraint, I don't want to spend too much time. This first one is about an empty container reposition. The empty container is very, very important. I think we don't have time to talk about detail. But you know, we got the uh, motivation from all Sierra, you know, design, uh, use net, uh, cooperation game to, to hope then they cooperate, you know, to empty. The next one is about one ship point of view. You have different carrier, different freeway, different transit time. The longer transit time you your freeway is cheap. So how do you select? Consider about if you are long delay, then you arrive or you are, uh, you put out maybe you know out of day. Okay, so this one. So this will develop the this is the one get the, the student paper award. And also we use from the carrier point of view and we also work in the, this the big one, you know, we are huge network design. We are still you try to use the real data to test it. So this is the in the working paper. Since the time constraint, I am going to stop here. I will let uh Professor Abhat talk about area two. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chong Yi, and good morning. Now, uh, in the interest of time, I will give you, my goal is to give you an overview of what we have done, and then if you have questions, we will be happy, including my team member, to answer your question. So the focus of this area is on the strategic interaction of the player in the industry. Our goal is to develop some innovative business practices that can improve the performance of the firm in Hong Kong as well as Hong Kong as an international port in the industry. First, I want to show you an overview of the industry structure. So we start with the port authority of a location, say of Hong Kong, uh, that provide land and infrastructure for port operation. Then we have turn operate, terminal operators that offer services such as loading and unloading, storage of container uh, to the container carriers. Container carriers, they have a major player in the industry and they provide transportation services. And they sell these services through two channels. One is a direct channel to, uh, with long-term contracts with shippers like Walmart like Philips uh, Electronics. And they also sell their services through forwarders. That in turn sell the capacity in a, on spot mar on in, a, uh, in a spot market. So given the complexities of the industry, we focus on a few important topics that provide opportunity for firms to coordinate and improve their decision making so that we can improve the overall supply chain. So uh, there are six topics, contracting, firm to firm information sharing, uh, competition revenue management, uh, shipping securitization, and information sharing and competition with other parts in the region. So first, contracting was the motivation. Now we see that in that industry, one very interesting characteristic is we have contracting at multi-level. We have contract between terminal operators and ocean carrier. And ocean carrier with forwarder, 
or shippers. And it's also in a highly volatile environment. When we talk to people in the industry, they say a major challenge is risk management. The first cause uncertainty in weather and demand. So this opened the opportunities of seeing how we can use contract to incentivize firm to cooperate. And we learned in the literature that in many in, uh, supply chain of manufactured goods, like apparel, like high-tech products, by using contract, we can improve coordination. So we want to see to what extent we can apply this approach to coordinate a surface supply chain, like in ocean carrier container industry. Uh, so we have done, uh, we have completed a few papers and uh, the focus is to use contract to improve coordinations of several different operational decisions, such as storage of container, uh, capacity allocation, and uh, container repositioning. So I'll give you an example. Suppose a ocean carriers arrive at a port, then they can decide either to store the container at the yard or they can pay a cost to transport the containers to a remote area with a cheaper storage cost. But because of the conflict of interest, they may not always make the best decision. But uh, so we try to explore using pricing scheme offered by the container terminal operator to incentivize uh, the ocean carriers to uh, improve their uh, storage decision making that benefit the supply chain. The second one is about firm-to-firm -firm information sharing. When we talk to executives in the industry, what we learn is information uh, play an important role in their surface excellence. So in fact, a lot of terminal operators like HIT and Ocean Container Carrier, uh, OCCL, they invest heavily in IT. Uh, and we learn from supply chain literature that uh, by sharing information, sometimes firm can improve the overall performance, but of course there could be conflict of interest because company may not use the information for the best of the supply chain, but only for their own use. So here we have some project that is in progress. Now when a container carriers have a ship arriving at the terminal, before arrival, if they share information about the cargo types, uh, the volume and things like that, then the ocean uh, contain, uh, terminal operators can improve their planning by having this information. So the goal of this project is to evaluate the values of sharing this information. From the firm competition, uh, so another characteristic of this industry is we see that there is intense competition at different level between ocean containers, carriers, between forwarders. Uh, so with this competition, there's also an interesting opportunity. What about if they collaborate, if the competitor collaborate? Uh, so we have a very interesting paper that uh, some of our team members has uh, completed, and they look at the setting of uh, the ocean carriers selling capacity to uh, multiple forwarders who are competing. Now, uh, what they propose is, what about if the foresters, after they buy capacity from the ocean carrier, what if they trade the capacity by collaboration? And it turns out that with that collaboration, that can create a win-win situation. Not only the foresters can benefit by lowering the cost of uh, purchasing the capacity, uh, but the ocean carrier also better off because they can get a higher volume from the forester. And revenue management. Now, revenue management, as we know that uh, this is quite popular in industries that face a lot of volatility in terms of price and demand. So ocean carrier industry fit that scenario very well. And what we want to study is how we can use pricing and capacity allocation to improve the profit of uh, the firms in the industry. And in particular, for ocean carriers, they can sell capacity either through long-term contract with strippers or to the forwarder in the spot market. So we want to try to understand how, say, we can uh, uh, better manage that capacity allocation to these two cha channels. And when our team members talk to the industry, we find that uh, one important challenge that they face is uh, sometimes the shippers may not always honor the long-term contract. So they may have an incentive to default when the spot market price is lower than the contract price. Uh, how to address this problem? Uh, so we propose uh, two uh, possible solutions. The first one is what we call price matching. 
So that means the ocean carrier will promise in the contract that they are willing to match the price difference if the spot market price is lower than the contract uh, price. The second one is using capacity allocation. So what happened is what we learned from the executives is uh, we have high season and low season. And it's usually the case that during low season period, uh, it's more likely for the spot market price to be lower. But while in high demand seasons, then the then the ocean carrier may not have enough capacity to meet all the demand from the uh, forwarders. So in that case, uh, what our team member proposed is what about using capacity allocation to incentivize the shipper to discourage them to default. If the shipper, if a shipper default in the low demand season, then in the next high demand season, uh, that shipper may be penalized with a less favorable capacity allocation. So this is another way to incentivize the shippers to honor the long-term contract. So in a way that will also reduce the uh, volatility uh, in the uh, capacity allocation in the industry in the long term. The fifth one is about shipping secu securitization. Uh, so we see that the shipping services become more commoditized. A lot of uh, ocean carrier offering similar services with different uh, with little differentiation. And also there's a lot of volatility in the operations. So uh, some team members start investigating how securitization can provide a means to hedge against market volatility. And there are some uh, work in progress. One is about uh, using oil commodity market to hedge against the fuel cost uncertainty uh, in the ocean carrier's operation. The other one is about the modeling of Baltic Drive Index, BDI. BDI is commonly used as an index to measure the cost of transporting raw material. And in the industry, typically, that models something like a stock index. Our, our Team members try to explore an alternative approach of using so-called fractional Brownian motion. <laughs> okay, the last one is about information sharing and competition between parts in the long region. I apologize for the very long title, but it's necessary to capture to go to to highlight what we uh, what we want to do uh, in that particular topic. What's the motiv motivation? Now, if you look at uh, ports like Hong Kong and Shenzhen, they are in very strong competition. But there may also be opportunities for ports in the same region to collaborate so that they can compete with ports in other regions. So we try to explore these uh, opportunities and do some investigation to see uh, how we can improve the competitiveness of, uh, of the port in this kind of setting. What we have done, so we have completed uh, two working papers uh, in this topic. The first one is about the uh, port, facility, uh, port uh, owner's capacity allocation. So when you have a terminal that receives carriers, uh, different carriers, there are two basic strategies. One is we can allocate capacity uh, to uh, serve both carriers, so we call that pooled capacity. The other one is the uh, port operators can dedicate uh, capacity to each carrier, so we try to understand under what condition, which strategy is better. The other one is about competition in the so-called dual gateway port system. So typically, when two ports compete in surface quality, they have uh, they may either use a common operator or they may use two different operators. So we try to study. Uh, under what conditions uh, one operator or two operators will uh, change the surface quality offered by the port and affect their competition. Okay, so I will pass to my uh, colleague, uh, James, to present on the third area. Thanks, and good morning. And uh, I think, uh, the previous two presentations already covered a lot, which is more or less talking about optim optimization of the operations in terms of uh, terminal and shipping. And 
both actually trying to say we can strengthen uh, Hong Kong's uh, position by a better uh, terminal operation and uh, shipping. But uh, we also noticed from the very last page just showed that uh, there is a possibility eventually these new methodologies or whatever concept will be transferred nearby to other ports. So how can we keep uh, one step or even consistently leading uh, position in the Pearl River Delta could be very key issue. And then because of that, when we look into strategic future direction, we believe that the role of Hong Kong container port um, not only need to uh, be reflected, but certain innovative analysis framework is needed to probably re-exam the entire nodal transportation and the logistics system in Hong Kong and in the Pearl River Delta region. Because otherwise, maybe Hong Kong will follow London on, and the New York step into uh, areas with uh, probably financial center and a good airport, but without the support of port. So we need to link up the port with the other sectors, financial sectors or uh, the uh, air transport. To address that issue, I believe, and uh, my uh, uh, smaller uh, sub-team believe that uh, in uh, addressing this issue, we have to focus on institutional advantage for international trade. And we believe that a more integrated logistic se sector combining both seaports and airports for trade are necessary. To make uh, the things simple and uh, uh, also um, innovative. We try to say that uh, by far, so far, we see that uh, the uh practice and the research, particularly research, when focusing on global supply chains, GSC here, they look into global circulation of goods from door to door, but treating the infrastructure institution and regulations as a support from the regional or local government, which is outside this circle or focus. We try to reinvent and re, uh, redefine this kind of uh, consideration because when we discuss with local leading logistic firms like Lian Feng, we noticed and they say very clearly infrastructure, institutions, regulations, they are all part of a real world global supply chain. Without them, it's not a chain. It's just a kind of uh, operation, uh, business operation. So we believe that if you put that into as a component, government role is inside the chain, okay? Particularly uh, at the nodal uh, operation point like Hong Kong. Because of that, because we redefine the role of the government, when we come back to look at the chain and uh, the note, like a gateway in Hong Kong, the value added activities by global supply chains at the gateway, which is the core, and here it could be Hong Kong, and along the global, uh, global supply chain, there are several components that m government should and have to be involved. Intermodal infrastructure and its operation, trade facilitation procedures, regulations, standards, and laws. All of these three components have to have government support and involvement. And cluster of local uh, logistics support is also a key for us to understand what we can do better. So, so far we try to look into this issue by uh, researching the how can we move, uh, remove the trade barriers and to facilitate Hong Kong as related, uh, 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 as a, a, in relation to Hong Kong port and its user. We have a one paper just uh, at the very final stage. It's already uh, in the editor's uh, final proof. Uh, so we have completed a book chapter focused on interport competition in the Pearl River Delta, and we have conduct survey to Nanshan Port in Guangzhou, and realizing the differences between here and there, so that what is the real competitive advantage in Hong Kong? 
what we plan to continue our study, we want to survey logistic firms in the nearby cities like uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou. We are going to do this next month. And we also will investigate firms which also go to Shanghai, Ningbo, and other key uh, logistic hubs in the region to see that uh, particularly after the new policy that uh, Shanghai becomes a free train zone, and uh, what will be inside the so-called international log logistic parks, the different policy settings and the role of government, and co-evolution between uh, the government, the state role, and the firm's role, so that we can look into uh, a system uh, of data so that allow us to measure the nodal e effectiveness and the network capital of global supply chain using Hong Kong as opposed to using other places so that to develop indicators to analyze the competitive advantage of Hong Kong as a global supply chain hub. And now I pass to the next. Um, this is, uh, I, I am uh, responsible for the uh, last area, and which uh, is uh, this uh, integrated decision making uh, uh, systems. And this area, by definition, we probably need to wait for a little while to see what are the sort of uh, 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 you know decisions which we are going to uh, uh, make during the you know with other groups and in our previous workshop to a certain extent we after you know some sort of uh, identification and we decided we probably want to focus on those uh, strategic decision making rather than those uh, you know uh, operational issues so the one of the area we identify you know from the uh, second uh, speaker uh, even you know from the uh, first uh, you know speaker it probably I identify the area, it's a sort of a strategic decision making and you know, goes through with the sort of the contract setting. And even beyond this contract setting, and uh, uh, there's a number of the area which is mentioned in terms of the information sharing and in terms of, uh, you know, sort of the competition to a certain extent we sort of uh, try to look into uh, those areas. And we, what we try to do in decision making, and we want to do, you know, few things. One is the flexibility. The flexibility, put it the other way, is the sort of the usage. We are create uh, a number of the type of the contracts and uh, how the flexible of those contracts can be applied between a company A and B and a B and a C. And how those things which can be, uh, you know, in terms of in what terms and that sort of the contract can be, uh, you know, used. And uh, secondly, it's this about implementation issues and which uh, uh, Albert just mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, after sort of the long-term contract, you find out some sort of agent, they might walk away from that type of, the, you know, contract. So what do we try to look into is how those contract is designed in the incentive, you know, um, you know, again, you know, sort of uh, with uh, uh, those uh, players. And secondly, uh, uh, lastly, we want to look into what are the mechanisms. And uh, we mentioned, Albert mentioned, in terms of the pricing. And we also, in other areas of uh, the work, and we're looking into, they're probably related to the, the revenue, the sharing matters, and also related to, uh, in, um, you know, why we are working into the uh, uh, sort of uh, an, um, an empty containers. And we see, you know, uh, they're probably also involved with the transshipment, that type of, uh, you know, mechanism. Basically, we want to look into those contracts and uh, see. Uh, okay, okay, well, last minute. Okay, I finished this. So, uh, so, so, on that regarding, uh, we want to look into those, uh, you know, three areas, go through with the structure and also looking into contract terms, in terms of even in terms of the what are the, uh, the ways the money can change the hand, you know, before resolve the uncertainty or after resolve the uncertainty and with some contract that probably with a multiple payment which involved before resolve the uncertainty and after resolve the uncertainty. So so this is the sort of the structure we planning to put into the place and that uh, you know sort of we are going to have library and that library is the contract that we are doing and including in doing those uh, mechanisms. And we do analysis and uh, do classification and uh, try to giving some sort 
sort of the simulation and you, know, you can test different scenarios and you know, we do have a, a sort of a basic uh, uh, theoretical foundation uh, as well and we do have a, a paper which uh, write up and this is a sort of uh, uh, the plan we want to build up something which people can play with it thank you Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. So, um, can Evan uh, come up? Yes. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Four people. <laughs> thank you. So, so uh, your comment about uh, the rise of transshipment as a, as a ratio of total shipments is, yeah. is uh, important. And I think uh, industry is very interested in that because the taxation system is sort of disadvantaging them. Uh, Transitions are actually tax, I think, uh, as though they were regular shipments. And I'm wondering if that is something that uh, you are talking to industry about, and how would you address something like like this? Because that's a sort of a macro determinant of how competitive, uh, you know, both the shippers as well as as, as the uh, format is going to be relative to other other ports. According to what we talk to industry, they didn't mention this one particularly because they will kind of take it as you know government. Do. But 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 they are really concerned about they want a new batch terminal because because you know transshipment and uh, traditionally go through cross border by trucks, and then the age of truck is fifty eight years old. Average, can you believe truck driver? The truck driver average age is 58 years old. So the cross border, you know, transaction, the the the, the so-called you know truck from the China to here through the cross border by truck is decreasing more and more by batch. So recently, they got they lobby to government and even the newspaper report two weeks ago. They want to create new terminal in terms of batch terminal because that will help transmission as well as the, the one. So in terms of taxi, they didn't mention, you know, so we didn't really talk to government in terms of this particular issue. But of course they were concerned. I think the shipper council more concerned. But terminal operator, they were concerned about congestion. It's very congestion. And then also, you know, truck congestion, batch congestion as well as truck congestion. So Hong Kong traditionally, in last 15 years, only built about 8 million square feet warehouse in last 15 years. But in the next three years, they want to build 8 million square feet <laughs> for, uh, for big warehouse. Because warehouse is not there now, you know. But this taxi they didn't particularly mean to us. But we didn't talk to government. But this terminal operator recently become a big issue. Big issue, yeah. Um, I, I have a more um, not specifically related to the subject itself, but a more general question. What is the difference between academic research versus consultancies? Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, consultant usually is the development. We are from the basic research and then apply research. And then consulting, for example, we did a project for ITC, Innovation Technology Council. We develop a, a decision support system module. If company want us to do, we need to make the, it become user-friendly interface. That's a consultant usually. Can I just add one more point? So in terms of uh, consulting and academic research, I, I believe the key difference is the academic research will pursue uh, publications. And uh, consulting, uh, you know, that type of work, you can do a consulting, same problems for company A, and uh, doing another similar thing for company B. We won't. We only doing what, and when the paper get published, and we are not doing. I mean, this academic research difference between academic research and a consulting. Okay, let me add my perspective because I'm not a consultant. I'm not a consultant. Uh, from my understanding, academic research we try to look at something more fundamental. We are not looking at the problem of one or two company. We want to look at the problem that is of interest to of many company or maybe a company different industry. And our goal is try to develop some 
universal principles that can help us either to solve problems in different settings or we can have a better understanding of the problem. Consulting project, you have to be very customized for the company, for the need of the company. So in a way, it offers different value. So for consulting project, you have to deliver the value immediately. For academic research, sometimes it may take time before you can realize the value, but it's something more fundamental from a point of view. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, well you, you, oh, there, there's another aspect to this question, which is and maybe this is more appropriate to the strategy part of the project. Is, you know, for example, suppose the Hong Kong government comes to you tomorrow and says, we need to do something about port congestion. How does any of this analysis apply to that question? Richard, uh, because of recent... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure that uh, government is also a client, say this way. Uh, but we do, uh, in our uh, research, particularly this one, we do share this concern, and otherwise we won't conduct this uh, study at all. But on the other hand, when do uh, academic research, we try to have some something solid in terms of uh, establishing, for example, indicators or measures or some methodology or concepts to contribute not only to for the government, but uh, for the uh, uh, academia kind of a need. Uh, but on the other hand, I do share this concern. We do believe that because this is a applied kind of a uh, research, we do have uh, a components that very clearly addressing the uh, some issues issues that concern the government most. For example, when I mentioned the, uh, uh, this is, I did otherwise, thank you for raising this question, otherwise I got no chance to s explain this a new thing about Shanghai free trade zone. Uh, because the free trade zone w has a new components that's highly related to Hong Kong port because they released a constraint on sabot uh, uh, cabotage. That means that uh, the some ships do not need to come to Hong Kong to do the transshipment anymore. That will have a very serious hit of Hong Kong's support operation in next year. Okay, That's very serious business. And this is why suddenly the port operators coming out to, to try their best to convince government to do something more. And what are the something more? How, how can we do something that to capture at least the local transshipment part, that's the transshipment from Pearl River data, if Shanghai is no longer, you know, uh, get chance uh, to, you know, Hong Kong is no longer get chance to have the uh, uh, transshipment otherwise to be located in Shanghai, relocated in Shanghai. So we need to do something immediately. And we do think that uh, after this research or during this research, we can provide some very important uh, suggestions to the government because we know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I think thanks. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, this research uh, brings a lot of uh, insights that would be useful to the uh, shipping industry. But my question is, uh, I guess from a practical standpoint, the uh, uh, one of the deliverables would be the decision support systems. So if there's uh, one decision support system, I mean, decision support systems need to be reasonably robust and simple to for it to be used. So arising from the project, if there's one decision support system that you know can simple enough to be used what would it be I think that's just a general question because that relates to area 3 because area 3 you touch on institution regulations and it's not clear how I mean of course the, the, the nodos and these are important but how does it fit in with the first two areas I mean moving forward the interaction is is not clear it's not so easily quantified and basically so I just very general I just seek some comments Let me ask a second question first. So, uh, for example, you probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor James Wang uh, presented with the structure, and that is, uh, you know, existing uh, logistic structure which uh, contains one, two parts. One is the infrastructure, and the other is the policy making side. 
So, and he was talking about if you want to really want to have, uh, you know, sort of a fully integrated or successful uh, logistic systems, you probably need to look into both. So in terms of the co collaboration between different areas, area three, and when we, you know, working on logistical problems, usually, and we're looking into the left-hand side, and we didn't put in the third, I mean, the second part into our uh, big logistical picture. So by, you know, collaborating with uh, Professor Wang, and we are working in terms of the, you know, if we can break down with the government, uh, you know, sort of the regulation, or you have uh, new ways to allow us to do things, and we might have uh, different logistical systems. By doing that, and we generate, uh, you know, working papers which are looking into the sort of new thing. In China, there are many, the so-called dry port. So in the past, you only working with the sea port. And now there are dry port, and with dry port, you have a different things. I mean, so, so you can look into a different structure. So that sort of thing, we are working on that part as well. And uh, uh, we also um, uh, try to uh, get uh, you know, um, funding from other sources as well. As well. Uh, yeah. I, of course, I can, you know. Sure. Let, 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 let yeah, I, I think I can have two examples to show that uh, in the past few months, or probably a year, uh, we uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Lee and Professor Hao, we, we try to work together to see there's something we can link up with each other uh, in different uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, subgroups. One thing is that uh, when doing optimization, which part is more important than other part? Because when we look at other ports nearby Shenzhen and Guangzhou, something very similar. So which part is not similar? What is the distinguished uh, advantage of Hong Kong? And we may focus on our research on those part, which is uh, 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 optimization with uh, uh, Hong Kong advance or competitiveness. So this is one area that we can link up with to look, for example, terminal at the terminal level. What is the, uh, that's the, relating to the second uh, uh, case I, I want to mention. That eventually, uh, what my part is supposed to do is to have a, a kind of indicators to look into uh, for example, in terms of time, uh, what kind of procedures consume how much time of our clients using Hong Kong through the customs, through uh, the terminals, or in other procedure uh, uh, within Hong Kong or beyond. And that part is also related to the previous uh, two sectors. They, uh, they have uh, um, uh, optimization of the shipping and terminal, we focus on other elements that also speed up the procedures that uh, the global supply chain use in Hong Kong. So in this way, we have some kind of connections. Uh, beyond that, the third one could be how the uh, uh, the third party logistics company in Hong Kong doing both air and uh, 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 water transport. W is there anything that they can benefit from this? And why it's important for them or for us to set up some kind of policy to let those box opened within Hong Kong so we have a more value added logistics to do to uh, to to generate more jobs in Hong Kong. Last one, I think. Well, it's partly a follow up to the, the some of the points you mentioned earlier, on, and partly on a more general aspect. You know. We know that the Hong Kong is un the Hong Kong port is under a lot of challenge. Uh, the most optimistic projection for container throughput in Hong Kong is it just grows very slowly. If this cabotage issue becomes serious, then probably the future volume will go down. So uh, if you look forward in the next 10, 15 years, the, the prospect is you know, at least not very encouraging. And then we also face other challenges like the shortage of land, the aging workforce, so on and so forth, increasing competition and so on. So the, the, the point I'm trying to say is, well, the subject of your study is transforming Hong Kong's ocean container transport logistics network. But if you just focus on a very narrow definition of this overall subject, you are dealing with, you know, an industry that is not having a very good prospect, and and I think that is a, that is a challenge. So, f coming back to the o original purpose of the whole, you know, LGC theme-based research, we want to identify areas which would, you know, 
benefit Hong Kong's long-term development as an economy, as a business center, and so forth. Uh, without leaving the, the main thrust of your main subject, I guess there would be areas that you could focus on. You know, rather than all looking at I, I raised my question earlier on about consultancies because if you focus too much on the operational issues of the current operations, then you tend to forget about these longer term issues which I think first of all is more open to to academic ideas and secondly fit better into the overall theme of the whole thing and, and just just my, my thoughts and feelings. I, I'm sure there are lots of areas, you know, some of them you have mentioned earlier on that we could look into. I, can I try to uh, answer this question? And, uh, and I know, uh, so I know you, you have to let me try to uh, tackle this. Uh, so that's why, you know, looking into this project, we are, you know, of course, we're looking into the angle from the uh, container port logistic uh, systems. But we do have a mindset about uh, what you just mentioned. You know, if we're only working on the, you know, only working on the logistic side, we probably, you know, uh, with some limitation. However, if you bring the uh, previous study into this picture, you probably see different things. For example, of course, the other side in, in China, they open with the uh, Shanghai free trading zones. So the question is whether our Hong Kong, you know, in terms of finance or even in, the, in terms of logistics, is going to be suffered. Uh, so they are giving you a one indication. What I'm trying to say, if you look at this logistical things, and we do need uh, financial services, and we do need uh, insurances, those things, you know, if we combine them together, just take one factor. In China, you, know, you need a so-called uh, deposit, a bank deposit, 20%, right? So in Hong Kong and uh, banks, we don't have that sort of the requirement. On that alone, you, know, you probably, you know, get a one percent of the advantage in, by doing business in Hong Kong and uh, compare doing in, in Shanghai. And I'm sure my colleagues probably can add in more. So, so the theme based research, I mean, even though uh, they are, you know, uh, uh, UGC, RGC people, what I'm trying to say, probably there's a sort of the theme we can work with the different, uh, you know, sort of the projects. I'm sure the uh, Professor Zhou, you probably want to mention yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm part of the your guy, but I raised question. Uh, just a very simple one, uh, and also related to uh, you talking about more fundamental. Uh, I do think they have fundamental knowledge about the container port that we are not really known. I, I would like to see what is that, the life cycle of container port. The life cycle. What they mean? The port grow, and then in the end they will die. That, that obviously uh, they uh, most likely happen. And then, so any theory or your guy will address that kind of theory. Uh, the port grows, and and and, and then in the end will die. But we will do present uh, some policy to pro prolong or enduring their life cycle. So that relate to a couple of fundamental relations. For example. The, the port, the relation with the goods, the final thing, the goods, uh, the port relate to the port himself. For example, some port water not deep enough, they will die. Okay, and then uh, so and production base, the port relate to product production base also will go. Okay, as far as I, I study, the port will. Production, uh, production base and goods, those is a kind of fundamental relation. And uh, here, for example, we talk about Shanghai. Shanghai port is not good enough, and then they can build another one 40 kilometers away, which means they overcome uh, some the, the port. But in the end, if we assume the Pearl River Delta and the Yangtze River Delta, they are no longer a, a, a production base. So like, like that kind of thing uh, could be a, a, a theory or, or fun or fun. Maybe uh, let me uh, <coughs> uh, try my best to answer my colleagues, Simon's. We, we are in the same department. We're very lucky we are here for the two uh, theme base. Uh, first of all, I believe that uh, one thing that uh, Simon addresses, uh, we call it, uh, uh, jargon, is that uh, port regionalization. That means uh, we have uh, more than one port in a region when the business is, is just too big to ha to be handled by one port. That is happening in Shanghai and happening in Hong Kong. Secondly, I do believe, and uh, 
votes uh, of you mentioned that uh, Hong Kong's uh, port business is not that uh, promising, okay, without any doubt. Uh, but this is uh, exactly what, uh, uh, when I show the chart, I try to put government, to put the, the role of government into the, the chain kind of a model because we believe that Hong Kong has this advantage, okay, over Shenzhen or even Shanghai in terms of uh, free trade, for example. At the same time, we also realized Hong Kong has such a kind of a rigid mentality in the government to slow down any change, necessary change in terms of uh, laws and regulations. Once we touch upon law, immediately government officials would say, sorry, it's very difficult for me to change even a little bit of laws that take probably three to six years for any small change of laws. And then we realize that in China, for example, nearby, they change no matter rational or irrational very rapidly, whatever needed for whatever the reason, probably not justified, but they change. They change immediately for some kind of a reason. So we try to, in this project, try to look at is any way we can have a new idea that will sustain Hong Kong at least every moment one step or even further ahead of other nodes. In, not in the narrow definition of terminal operation, but in general, the whole logistic environment. Because we trust the one thing that uh, uh, I think uh, professors in logistics know very well about transport, there are hierarchical structure. There's a need for some hubs always, different levels of a hub to cover different level of regions. We are one of those hubs which may uh, sustain our role as a hub, but what kind of hub? That is why we look into uh, deeply the terminal operation together with air transport, etc. Many other. Maybe at the very beginning when we struck this uh, title, the title is a little bit narrow in a sense, but uh, we were challenged at the very beginning we should have uh, more, uh, including uh, other businesses in, in terms of logistics and uh, value added logistics locally and the air transport, etc. And we we also need to look into the regional uh, port operation. And this is why we come up uh, now. Well, if I may, uh, I want to take one or two minutes to address the question from this gentleman. So uh, if you look at the structures of the, our approach of our research, we do not just focus on the operations. So we start with looking at the operation from the firm level. So we explore opportunity for a firm to collaborate. In the end, we want to look at the role of the government too and look at how we can improve the overall supply chain. So how Hong Kong can become competitive? Just being an excellent part is not enough. You need to offer value for the whole supply chain point of view, for the, from the ship point of view, they need to get services for the whole supply chain, not just for the support operation. So that's why we take a rather holistic view when we try to attack this problem, the challenge, grand challenge of how to make Hong Kong more competitive in that ocean container industry. I think I'm going to have to bring us to a close at this point. We're over half an hour beyond our, our allocated time. Uh, and just thank uh, both sets of presenters for very nice presentations, excellent discussion from the audience. I would like to say that this session comes to a close, but if you'd like to continue the discussions, there's a poster session just outside uh, of Race and Huang Theater. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much.